And one thing about me is those who take chances make advances. I'm a seize the opportunity if it's in front of my face. So he was on the Zoom and I'm like, hey, Steve, <laughs> my name is Pinky and you don't know me, but you need to look me up. And I think that we need to do a shoe deal because there is no shoe deal in the restaurant vegan space. And I think that this will be a game changer and it'll be massive. And you know what he said? He said, I love it. He said, let's set that shit up. <laughs> he said, I'm going to send you my assistant email. Let's do it. And that's exactly how it happened. All because I opened up my mouth and asked. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. All right, guys, welcome back. EYL, Atlanta headquarters. Yeah. This is something that we've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, tried to make it happen several times in the past. <laughs> but the day was January 21. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nothing nothing Many happened. Moons ago. Nothing happens before it's time. So, uh, Pinky Cole, the legendary owner of Slutty Vegan. If you have never ate Slutty Vegan, you're doing yourself a tremendous disservice. Let's start there. That's a fact. <laughs> Let's just start there. And I've only actually had it a few times because one of the reasons is that I always heard the line is like down the block and you can't actually get in. Mm-hmm. Good um, problems. Yeah. Good problems. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but just an amazing story we're going to talk about. But you probably heard recently in the news that just finished your Series A. Congratulations. Raised $25 million, I believe, for 25% of the company, which gave you a valuation of $100 million for your brand. Mm-hmm. Um, with plans, I believe, to expand to 20 locations. Nationwide, you do your research. <laughs> We've been known to. <laughs> We're the biggest for a reason. <laughs> We've been known to. Um, you know, you got collaboration, brand partnerships, and it's just a really inspiring story. Um, starting from you know humble beginnings and scaling to you know national, global brand, yeah. and have become a rock star in the space as far as for entrepreneurship. We were just talking about that. I always had an vision that, you know, entrepreneurs are going to become the new superstars like athletes and rappers. And mm-hmm. you're definitely one of those people. Um, rap snacks. I believe you have your own rap yeah. snacks. That was a moment for Shout us. Shout Lindsay and the yeah. team over there. We went yeah. to the headquarters and we were kind of saying like, yeah, we should have a bag. And then we looked. Y'all should definitely have a bag. And we saw your face <laughs> on the bag. We like, yeah, we definitely should have a bag. So thank you for the yeah, inspiration yeah, yeah. for that. Cool. And uh, you're doing all of this while still being a mother. You're actually yeah. pregnant Real right time. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's eight eight point okay, five months. Earn your leisure, baby. Don't okay. worry. Don't legendary. worry. We got the van outside ready to go. That'll be a legendary <laughs> moment. That'll be a legendary moment. That's it all. So this this is gonna be a dope interview. So first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I watch you guys, and I'm proud of y'all, and I'm happy to be here. And I think this is gonna be a real dope conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it has legendary vibes. I can feel it. Yes. So let's get into this. Um. For anybody that might not have heard your story before, can you just, you know, talk about the backstory a little bit? Like, what made you want to start the Slutty Vegan um, franchise? What made you actually want to go vegan? And um, how did you, you know, get your foot up and running with, you know, what you do now? So it depends on what back means. I could go all the way. <laughs> Let's start in Jamaica. <laughs> um, so, you know, my story is very interesting um, and unique to say the least. So the day that I was born, I was born December 8th, 1987. Um, And the day that I was born, my father was being sentenced to 30 plus years in prison. So he was getting his sentence in the day that I was coming out the womb. So I already came into the world with the short end of the stick Mm. based on what society tells you. In Baltimore. In Baltimore. Right. Right. So growing up, I saw my mother who was raising five children take care of everybody. Right. With limited resources. She had between four to five jobs. My mother was a musician. She worked at the bank. She worked at McDonald's at one point. She was processing payroll. She was doing everything. But one thing she made sure of is that the lights were always on, that we always had food on the table, that I ain't never had to beg, borrow, steal from nobody. And she always made sure that I would go to federal prison with my siblings to Mm. go see my daddy. Mm. Right. So here I am growing up. Going to Hagerstown, Jessup, Maryland, having a little one as a kid, being limited to two hours at a time to see my father. But what it did, it was teaching me a valuable lesson that ain't nothing in the world like freedom. Mm -hmm. So throughout my life, I aim to get 
the level of freedom where nobody had to tell me what to do, where I didn't have to answer to nobody. And that is how I became a hustler. So in high school, I started throwing parties. I was the youngest promoter in Baltimore, Maryland. I was selling candy, frozen cups, McChickens, you name it. I was sell- for real. I would go to McDonald's and buy McChickens for a dollar and come back in the cafeteria in high school and sell them for two dollars. My mindset was make money, create opportunity, make people feel good. And I did that throughout the years. And when I graduated college, um, when I graduated high school, I saw Ludacris on TV and I'm like, oh, he's at Clark Atlanta University. I'm going there. And fast forward, my entrepreneurial journey just continued to rise and rise and rise. Went to Clark Atlanta, became Miss Clark Atlanta University, packed up my bags after I graduated, moved to Los Angeles, California, because I had these big dreams of being an actress. That ain't work out, but I'm glad (laughs) that it didn't. And while I was in L.A., I got an opportunity to work as a television producer, well, a PA at the time. And if you know anything about TV, like you got to be really, really good to get promoted. So one thing I know how to do well is run my mouth. So while I was in L.A., I was working as a production assistant and I got a call to work in New York, packed up my bags, moved to New York. While I was in New York, became a producer, got another call to work at the Maury Show. While I was at the Maury Show, I saved up my 401k. And here I am, 26 years old, don't know the first thing about 401k except for contribute. And it's going to be money in there. Mm -hmm. I pulled my 401k out. And I opened up my first restaurant and it was called Pinky's Jamaican and American Restaurant. This is in Harlem. This is in Harlem. How much money was in your 401k that you took out? I had 27,000 at the time, which was a lot of money for me, right? Somebody in their early 20s, like I was balling. Like I thought I I was on top of the world, right? But I've always been a risk taker. So I pulled it, right? Not knowing that I was going to be taxed on it later, Mm. right? But I pulled it out. Got a family friend to give me a loan and I opened up my first restaurant and it was called Pinky's Jamaican and American Restaurant. And it did seemingly well for somebody who didn't know what the hell they were doing. Right. And when I had that restaurant, I had a grease fire after about two years. And I want to stop here because that was like the best thing that could have happened to me because it propelled me to be able to create what we now know is slightly vegan because what looked like failure wasn't failure to me at all. Right. It was really an opportunity to say, okay, all right, this look a little fucked up, but I'm going to do this again. And when I do it again, it's going to be right. And it was right because after I lost everything, car got repoed, got evicted out of my apartment, went flat, broke, failed relationships. I got an opportunity to work as a casting director. And the reason why I'm telling you all this story, because I want to make it full circle. Right. So I got an opportunity to work as a casting director in Los Angeles um, on an own network show. And while I was there, they're like, Pinky, we need you to go to Atlanta. And I'm like, I don't really want to go to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Like I went to school there. Yeah, my sorority sisters are there, but that's just not that's not where I want to be. But I did it. And I was only supposed to be there for three months, y'all. And when I went to Atlanta, I was in my bedroom and I was hungry and I wanted some vegan comfort food. Now, I'm like, y'all. I am a conscious thinker. I'm always trying to feed myself, always trying to learn more. So at the time I was running every single day, reading a book every single day. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody told me I was crazy. I just knew that I was preparing for something. And when I was in my bedroom, slutty vegan hit me like a light bulb, like no rhyme, no reason, no like precursor, no nothing. It just hit me out of nowhere. I'm like, damn, that's a dope ass name. Mm. So I called my friends up and I'm like, what y'all think about this name? And it was like, I love it. You need to do something with it. So I went to Google and I went to YouTube and I just started researching. And what I realized is I didn't know the first thing about burgers and fries because I'm Jamaican. Right. So like I didn't grow up eating that. But this was something that was missing in the marketplace coupled with the experience. So no business plan, no real plan. I just started researching, opened up this ghost kitchen and literally the rest is history. So there's a there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot yeah. because I, I obviously the background in TV is that what you studied when you were at at Clark? Was it audio uh, engineering and, and TV production? Was well, that- I was supposed to study that, <laughs> but I never had an internship yeah. in my life. So how do how do we shift to culinary? Is that something that you have been doing growing up? Obviously, being in a Jamaican home, I know that like especially like my mom cooks all the time and. I could cook a little bit. Some might argue that. But is that something that you just naturally were gifted at, at being a chef? I ain't no chef. (laughs) I really don't think I can cook that well. Like, I think, you know, my food tastes good to me, but I didn't go to school to be a chef. I have no formal training. 
And it really just happened that way. And that's what life does, right? Like life just happens sometimes. Yeah. And it became a passion project for me. So when people call me a chef, I'm like, yo, I'm not a chef. Like <laughs> this is just a passion project for me. Um, and TV was something that I fell into that I became really, really good at. So I'm happy that I got the opportunity to work in TV because what happened was is it taught me how to meet people where they are. Mm. One thing that I could do really, really well is I know how to connect people. I don't care if you make a billion dollars. I don't care if you make five dollars. I can put everybody in a room and make everybody feel welcome and like they are important. And I learned that working in TV. Mm. So I coupled my TV experience with the fact that I'm a foodie and I love to eat. And I merged those two most pleasurable experiences in life. That's sex and that's food. And I built this concept to make people love it, even if they didn't like the name. And literally everything has been up from there. So let's talk about this ghost kitchen situation. Shout out to my boy, Nacho Benga. He's the first person on our Mm -hmm. platform to talk about ghost kitchen, another Baltimore native. Um, So ghost kitchen is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people still aren't really familiar with ghost kitchens. But from my understanding, the ghost kitchen is you don't have a physical like restaurant, Mm -hmm. but you have like an, let's say like an industrial kitchen. And out of that kitchen, you can cook. And have your food sent on Uber Eats or DoorDash. Mm-hmm. And the good thing with the ghost kitchens is that nobody really knows. Like when you order Uber Eats, you don't really necessarily know where you're ordering it from. You don't know where you're ordering, what it looked like. It's yeah. clean, nothing. It's a risk that you take. <laughs> yeah. But the good thing about ghost kitchens, and it's funny because when I came to Atlanta, they weren't really familiar with ghost kitchens. They're like, what's this? And I'm like, listen, they do this in L.A. You know, L.A. was a little bit more advanced. Yeah. And I'm like, they do this in L.A. Let me duplicate it here. So I was like the guinea pig in Atlanta. And the one thing that I liked about the ghost kitchen is it's not a lot of overhead. They charge you. I mean, the, the, the prices are different now, but they ch- at the time they were charging me 30 percent. Right. To be on the platform. I'm on Uber Eats. I'm on DoorDash. I'm on Grubhub. I'm on Postmates. And every time somebody ordered food, all I did was fulfill the order. What happened with Slutty Vegan is that people started DMing me their orders and I started fulfilling on DM. Right. So I'm like, all right. So now I got this e-commerce platform on Instagram that just happened by mistake. And it actually worked out because the first week I had about four people. And the week after that, I had about 30 people. And every single week it started building and building. Soon after I had between like 150 to 300 to 500 people standing out the door trying to get food, sending messages on Instagram. So for the people who are watching this, ghost kitchens are absolutely a good opportunity to get into the business if you want to do a restaurant concept because you can test it and don't have to worry about putting all the risk in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we feel like we won't be successful until we get a brick and mortar. That ain't the truth because brick and mortars cost money. Mm -hmm. You got to pay light bill. You got to pay water bill. If your roof cave in, you got to pay all of that stuff. There's so much bills that come behind it, but a ghost kitchen will allow you the opportunity to test your concept. And if it works, then you can move forward with the, you know, all the other things. So were you actually cooking? At the ghost kitchen? I I was the cook, Mm -hmm. the janitor. (laughs) I was everything. I was accounts payable, accounts receivable. I literally did everything. And I did everything for the first two years of the business. How many items did you have on the menu? Um, Nine. Okay. Good number. Yeah. So That's uh, a great number. I'm a nine, actually, in my sorority. That's a great number. (laughs) Yeah. Another owner from, a restaurant owner from Baltimore said he keeps it at seven. Mm -hmm. Well, we can talk about that later on when we talk about the restaurant. But, Okay. So let's get this slutty vegan conversation going. So you have an idea to have you combine sex with food, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. And then you give these dishes like names. Like, can you talk about some of the names of the dishes? Absolutely. Let's start with my favorite. What's your favorite? The fussy hussy? It's my favorite. (laughs) Easily. So listen, when I created this concept, I'm like, food needs personality. Right. I don't know about y'all, but when I go to a restaurant, I eat with my eyes. But I said, how how about making people not only eat with their eyes, but eat with their ears, too? So when they hear the name of the food, it makes them like, oh, what is that? I want to try it. So we have the one night stand, which is our most popular burger. Right. And the one night stand is the patty with the bacon, the sauce, the onions and tomato. But like when you think about a one night stand, what do you think about? Like a euphoric experience. It happens once. It's crazy. It's kind of taboo. Mm-hmm. And everybody wants to be a part of that taboo experience, which is why it's the number one seller. <laughs> right. Then we have the sloppy toppy. Sloppy toppy. Sloppy <laughs> toppy. I don't know if kids watching this, but I'm sure we've all given or received some sloppy toppy. Right. So this it taps. It's true. It's true. To the, the taboo mind. A favorite, you think a favorite about. In, in. Yeah. It taps into that culture. 
and people, <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally, and you and I'm just talking about black people. It's all people. All right? people of all kinds. Um, yeah. Then we have the fussy hussy, which you love, and that's like the all American, right? Like yeah. you go to a McDonald's, you go to a Burger King, everybody got a sandwich with pickles on it, right? Yeah. But we have a plethora for, plethora of names of burgers. But I really specifically did that because when you come to my restaurant, I don't want you to be like, well, let me get the one number four with the the five, and no, nah, I wanted you to remember this experience so that by the time you leave you thinking about it and then you telling people like damn I remember when I went there I specifically had this and what it is is it's free marketing and advertising for me I've never had to pay for it because people like y'all who come to my restaurants be like yo you had slutty vegan like I gotta go try slutty vegan and I had the one night stand you should try it guess what they do they come to slutty vegan and say you know what my friend had what's that one night burger that one night stand let me try that mm-hmm. and that's how it's worked and that's how we've been having lines down the block it's like, what's that spot in Miami? The Call Me a Cab, all of that on on South Beach? Um, Wet Willies. Wet Willies. Yeah. It, it, or in, you know, former alumni, uh, our dudes from Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Slim Husky. Slim, Slim Husky. Husky. Oh, I love that. Very, very similar. Shout out to Slim Husky. You know, they, they infuse hip hop, you infuse sex. Yeah. Absolutely. Both cultural favorites. So, okay. Yeah. So you got a nice thing going with this ghost kitchen situation. You're building up traction on social media, you're making money. What's the next step? Food truck? So, yeah. So (laughs) there was a lot of next steps in between that. But I was in this prep kitchen and they told me that I had to leave because I had too many people coming and the tenants were upset about it. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? Is is it just you in the prep kitchen still with the 500 people outside? Everyone has an opinion when it comes to the foods we eat. This food's good for you. This one's bad for you. This diet works best. But who actually has the right answer? You don't need rules to lose weight. You just need proper information to build smarter, more sustainable habits. Noom is here to change the way we view food by not only looking at what we eat, but also how we eat. Instead of making you feel guilt, Noom empowers you to keep going. Not everyone wants to be on a strict diet, do five days a week at the gym, or have daily smoothies and questionable teas. Noom uses a psychology-based approach to find healthier balance that's more suitable for your life and as a result, more sustainable. Look, Numa's already influenced the way I shop for food, which has not only saved me money, it's also given me a clearer understanding of the foods I'm consuming, which has made me sharper and more energetic. You have to try it out. Look, there are no food restrictions in the program, which makes the process more flexible for your lifestyle. Everybody's journey is different. Noom believes in progress, not perfection. 75% of Noom users finish the program and more than 60% of users engaged with the program keep the weight off for a year or even more. With Noom, all you need is a daily 10-minute check-in. No grueling early mornings or huge chunks out of your day. Are you ready to start building better habits for healthier, long-term results? Sign up for a Noom trial at Noom.com slash leisure. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash leisure. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Head over there now. Yeah, it's me in the prep kitchen and then there are other tenants. So, you know, a prep kitchen, there's probably like 150 people that are registered to this unit and they schedule time to be in the space. So I was impeding on their business because I had so many people support mine, Mm. which was a good problem for me. But to other people, they probably like, okay, well, I can't make no money if all the people stand in front like this. And they told me that I had to leave. And, you know, it's so interesting life, right? Because now all of this is like full circle moments to me, even as I'm sitting here, I realized that if they would have never evicted me because it was like a pseudo eviction, I would have never been here having this conversation with y'all because it wouldn't have pushed me to have to get a food truck. Mm. Right. I had to get a food truck, not because I wanted to. I never would have gotten a food truck unless they until they put me out and I needed to get a food truck so that I can continue on with the audience that I had. So I went and got a food truck. It was a lemon. Let's be clear. But it was a good lemon because it made me a lot of money. (laughs) So I put $10,000 on a food truck, got it wrapped, never been on a food truck, damn near never ate from a food truck. But I needed to do something so that I can continue to leverage this audience. But it was because of that facility that told me that you got to go that made me want to do that. So like I'm forever grateful for them because I'm like, you don't even realize what you did. Mm -hmm. So with that food truck. People just started following me from the east side to the west side. Three hours before I pulled my food truck up, I would post an address. That's it. And when I tell you, people was running like I was Lil Wayne, like it was a concert. 
every single day with lawn chairs, with umbrellas, with their kids at the school, patiently waiting. And you know, black people don't wait for nothing. That's a fact. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> we ain't waiting for nothing. Except so the, for Jordans. Except for Jordans and stuff. And slutty vegan. And slutty vegan. 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 So are you putting this on social media? Like you're putting it out like a post like, hey, I'm going to be at this address today, three o'clock. It up. was, it was 5472 Johnson Road, 3 p.m. That's it. But that's another marketing strategy because it's like you're not going to the same location every single day. Not only are you not going to the same location, what I learned about the psyche of people is that when you keep things from people, it makes them want it more. Mm. We want to be spoon fed. Nobody will ever admit that. But like people love to just get a little bit at a time. It's like a relationship. If I give you everything in a relationship, realistically, sometimes people are going to get bored. Mm -hmm. But if you set some boundaries and say, okay, this is what I'm going to give you and like transparently do that, then people are going to keep coming. And they kept coming because I kept the relationship spicy. Everything had a sexual undertone, but had nothing to do with sex. Yeah. Right. So it was like it was kind of confusing, but it wasn't. So it made people want to ask questions. And then I realized that this is bigger than food. This is bigger than burgers, pies and fries. I've created a movement that people are proud to be a part of because now when I really tore the minds up is I started my foundation. And with my foundation, I started doing community work. So now what you want to say, I got a sexy name for a business, Mm -hmm. but I'm also helping out the whole entire community. I'm donating money. I'm paying the balances of students in school. What what are you really going to say that your kids can't go in there? Your kids on TikTok every day. And it worked. So now I have Muslims, Christians, white people, black people, old people, young people coming to support my brand. And they realize that it has nothing to do with sex. And it's not just about food. I'm building an ecosystem that everybody can be a part of. Yeah. So you obviously that I mean, that's incredible using the cultural capital. So we went from the ghost kitchen. We got to the food truck Mm -hmm. at this time. You're still not a chef. So what is the research that you're doing on the foods? Right. Because being a vegan it's not an easy task. So I, what, what's that process like of actually researching and finding the types of foods and what you can use and what you can't use? I've got the same menu that I've been here from the beginning. OK, so like I didn't change a thing. I probably changed like one little thing. But once I did that menu the first time, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why, mm. would, why would I change something now if I got all of these people standing in line? So mm. I didn't change anything. What I did was I streamlined the products in the business. So in the beginning, I had my brother whipping up sauce every single day for 500 people. Now I ain't got to do that because I got a co-packer, right? Mm. Fry seasoning. I used to make my fry seasoning every single day. Now I don't have to do that because I have a co-packer. But the most that I've done outside of starting the business with these same recipes is streamlined it with co-packers so I can make my process easier and keep the consistency of the business of what people fell in love with. Are you also trademark? Obviously, the name study being you trademarking, but the, the items on the menu, are you trademarking those? How does that work? Every single thing. It's funny. I, I just posted something. So I say banging, banging. If you like Slutty Vegan, is it banging, banging? I ask you that. And if they don't say it's banging, banging, then it's not good. But every single item is trademarked. Every single catchphrase is trademarked. We got trademarks overseas. Every, now, it costs a lot of money. Let's be clear. Yes. If you're watching this, this is not cheap. But I realized doing it in the beginning when you do it right you never got to do it twice. Mm. And I knew in my spirit, you know how something like you think of something and you know this going to be that thing. Mm. I knew Slutty Vegan was going to be that thing. So in the very beginning, I told my attorney, I want to trademark every single thing that I could trademark. And I did that. There is not one thing in my company that is not trademarked. Not one thing. Every single thing is trademarked. Very important. Yeah. Very, very important. And it's important because what I realized is, is that there are people who see a business growing and they don't think that you have those level of smarts. Mm-hmm. So they want to use your name. They want to try to get the websites. They want to do all of these things. But I'm like, nah, like I protected my business. And I learned that early on, especially having the, the restaurant in New York. I didn't have fire insurance. So I didn't get no money from that grease fire. Wow. And I said, and that's why I said in the beginning of my conversations, sometimes when bad things happen, that's the best thing that could happen for us. Because if my restaurant went to court on fire and I realized I didn't have fire insurance to be able to protect myself, I wouldn't have been like, okay, this new business, I got to make sure that my accountant is good. My uh, lawyer is good, that I got all the insurances that I need, that I'm protected. I got NDAs. I got confidentiality agreements, things that creatives don't really want to talk about because let's keep it real. You know, creatives really, and I'm talking about myself, I'm a creative, like that stuff to me is born. I just like to pursue and be great and manifest and do all of these spiritual things and like be great. 
But business got to happen. And in order for business to take place and to grow, you got to make sure that you are always buttoned up. And I did that with Slutty Vegan, and I'm so glad that I did. So you trademarked domestic and international. Domestic and internationally. Global expansion soon coming. Yep. Oh, I wasn't playing. I knew. <laughs> yeah, Listen, knew I knew it was that thing. When yeah. I was a kid, I said, I'm going to be a star. I didn't know what that meant. I said, I'm a, I was watching Golden Girls with my grandmother every day. <laughs> And while my friends was outside playing, I didn't grow up playing with Barbie dolls. I didn't grow up doing none of that. But I knew that I had a gift. And I didn't know that what that gift was. I didn't know how to sing. I barely knew how to dance. But I knew I had this. And as long as I had this, it was going to take me places. So when Slutty Vegan came, I felt it in my spirit that Slutty Vegan was going to be a billion dollar brand. And I speak that every single day. And I know it's going to manifest itself. So, okay. So you're doing the like scavenger hunt marketing strategy with the with the food trucks how often were you in the streets with the food truck every day or every single or different day. locations every single day every single day okay so every at, day. at what point does that scale into a physical restaurant well how it scaled is um i was working as the casting director still with the food truck and i got fired and i'm so happy that i got fired thank you to the person who fired me <laughs> But when I got fired, let me tell y'all this funny story. The day that I got fired, I went to Jeju. If you live in Atlanta, Jeju is a 24-hour spa, right? And I took my two, my, my left hand and my right hand, the people that were helping me to run the company. And we had just gotten out in the shower. We were eating some noodles. And I got a call from Jermaine Dupree. And he like, look, I got Snoop Dogg and Lil Duval here. They want some food. It was 1 a.m. in the morning. We had just settled down from being out all day. And I looked at my team. I'm like, yo, we got to go do this. They're like, Pinky, we tired. I said, listen, I said, nothing beats trial but a failure. You want to win? Put your clothes on. Let's go. And we put our clothes on and we fed Snoop Dogg. That was the day that I got fired. And do you know, ever since that happened, I had to get a brick and mortar because I couldn't keep up with the demand. Oh, he posted it? Yes. Mm. (laughs) He posted it. We posted it. And everything shot up from there. So the best thing that could have happened was me getting fired because it gave me an opportunity to feed. The, and all he ate was fries on camera. So, that yeah. cultural capital is real. You, I mean, even that part. So I, I'm thinking that you're doing this full time. You actually had the casting. That was like a nine to five situation while you were doing this. Well, I mean, TV is not really nine to five, but yeah. Yeah. So I had a team of seven that I was running yeah. and still working at Slutty Vegan. And I didn't even tell people that I had Slutty Vegan because I didn't want them to know. Yeah. Um, but when I got, excuse me, but when I got fired, I went all in. And because I couldn't keep up with the demand, somebody sent me a message on Instagram and they said, hey, we got a location for you. Somebody's getting evicted. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah. The space was 630 square feet. 630 square feet. And the landlord initially, he was just like, well, I don't know if you got a good business. I don't know if this is going to work, if it's just trendy. I said, listen, I said, you got to give me a chance. Cool. And I said, and if it don't work out, I will give you all your money back. And he gave me a chance and my grand opened, and I had 1,200 people standing outside for hours, eight hours to patronize my business in a 630 feet square foot space. So you so you built it. You built it with the ghost kitchen. You built the buzz. Then you built the buzz with the food truck. So by the time you had the physical location, you already had a cult following. Yeah. So they just happy a that you to see your growth. They've it's yeah. kind of similar to our story. What they've watched our growth. Mm-hmm. They've watched your growth, and now it's like you just didn't start a restaurant from nobody knowing you trying to build it. You already did the, the groundwork. So by the time you got the restaurant. The buzz is already there. Yep. The the buzz was there. The people were supporting me. And even till this day, I still got that location. It's my first location. Still got it. And what I realized is being transparent in business is so key. Oftentimes, people just want to show you the final product. Like, okay, this looks good. This is pretty. I never did that. I showed the moments where I was tired. Mm-hmm. I would post pictures tired in my car sleeping. Like, hey, the grind don't stop. But people felt like they were a part of that journey with me. Something that else that I did that's really good for entrepreneurs, my bag. You've been in my restaurant before, so I haven't. Oh, you haven't? You ate it. I ate we, it we, at Revolt. Okay. At Revolt. They um they gave it. Oh to yes, us. you said that. So if you look at slutty vegan bags where they put the food in, mm-hmm. that was from a winner from a competition that I did on Instagram. So I found all the opportunities to include my customers. Hey, we having a bag competition. Can you design a bag? Send in your favorite designs. And we're going to pick a winner and we're going to pay you and it's going to be our bag for Slutty Vegan. And I did that with almost everything in the business. So now I'm including people Mm -hmm. in the journey 
and growing at the same time. So people felt like they were a part. Building a community. Building a community. It's a lot of parallels, like even like our journey. I feel like, you know, people ask all the time, like, like when they when we started the show with podcast, they they look at it like it was an automatic success. But it was like it was a backstory behind that. Like we was on social media, doing social media for two years before. Mm-hmm. So by the time we started the podcast, the Instagram following was already there. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we just started a random podcast with no followers or anything. Mm-hmm. Like we had done work for two years to build an Instagram following yeah. and then drop the podcast where you similar. I think mm-hmm. like, you know, it's like a lot of people come out with a restaurant yeah. and nobody knows them from scratch. Yeah. It's hard to build that. But you started from the ghost kitchen to the food truck to the restaurant, which yeah. automatically gave you momentum and Another parallel in our stories is the community. Mm-hmm. So that was real big for us to actually have a community online, giving them names, calling them earners, mm-hmm. yeah. and you know asking questions. What do you think about this? So I remember my guy MG the mortgage guy. He said early on, he's like, "Your page is like the shade from financial literacy." Mm-hmm. People going back and forth in the comments, arguing with each other. Mm-hmm. The, the engagement <laughs> was crazy, mm-hmm. and it'd be like a social media like firestorm for financial yeah. literacy. So because that's the first time that I really heard about you a few years ago was. I forgot who told me it might have been Mike, but I heard about the name and then I started following the page and then your followers was just going crazy. It was like 10,000 followers every week. You was just gaining mm-hmm. followers, 10,000, 5,000, 15,000. followers yeah. too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like Yo, what, are they, what are they doing? Like, it was yeah. just like the, the momentum on social media was just going crazy. So talk about that from a marketing perspective as far as leveraging social media and, and doing organic marketing. Authenticity. You know, I was I was with a really big company um, yesterday and I was telling them it's funny. I was talking to them and I said, listen, I said, the next time you all have a board meeting, take a regular camera phone and just video the board meeting and then post it on your page. And they said, well, why would we do that? I said, well, do that because it's showing that y'all are real people, that people can touch you. And I think oftentimes what makes businesses successful is when people feel like you're tangible. And that's exactly how Slutty Vegan was able to grow. Like everything about us is authentic. It's real. Like we're, we're pleasant in the comments. So we're going to give you like some bougetto, right? Like we pleasant in the comments. Like we respond. Our customer service is A1. Like we got 24 hour customer service, but we're going to get with you and meet you where you are. And that social media has allowed us to gain more traffic in the business because people like realness. They like rawness. They like authenticity. And when I created the Slutty Vegan page, I'm like, all right, so I'm going to do three things. I'm going to make people laugh. I'm going to make them proud and I'm going to give them information, which I believe all social media business pages should do. Make people laugh. Right. And that's the engagement because they're going to talk, make them laugh, something funny. That's a meme. Make them proud. The accomplishments. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing in the community? What's the next phase in your journey? And give them information. What's on the menu today? What's happening with Slutty Vegan? Like, are we opening a new location? And because I've done that and been very consistent with that, it has worked. I post at the same times every day and have been posting like that since 2018. So now people are accustomed to getting that text. When you see it every day, it's almost like if we miss a moment and we don't post, they're like, well, what happened? Why didn't I post it? People like that level of consistency. But we've been able to do something that made people love our social media so much. They're like, I've got to go see what the hype is about. If, if, if the restaurant is anything like this social media, then I want to be a part of it. And it has worked for us since the very, very beginning. And we have in-house marketing. Like, we don't pay an agency outside to do it. We just sit around like this and like, all right, we should do this. Like, boom. Like, what are we going to do today? Like, I'll give you an example. We just did um, a deal with Steve Madden, which I could talk about. Um, Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a shoe deal. Um, and it's the first of its kind, the first shoe deal backed by PETA, which is really big because, you know, PETA don't play. Um, and it's the first shoe deal of Slutty Vegan, a restaurant with a shoe. Like, how does that happen? Yeah. Right. But we realized that we are a lifestyle brand first that happens to sell burgers, pies and fries. So um, what I did was we were sitting at the table and I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do a high fashion Vogue shoot. But guess what we're going to use? Employees. Mm. So we did a high fashion editorial Vogue L type shoot with all of our employees. So you got the fry cook, you got the managers, you got the HR assistant and high fashion hair styled up done. And now we're pitching it to the high class magazines because we're giving them opportunities. And we sit around and think about stuff like that. Every single person that you see on the social media page is an employee. 
So all the dreamers, all the people who want to be rappers, singers, artists, painters, you ain't got to flip burgers all day. What you know how to do? You know how to dance? Come on, do this video and we're going to put you on a page. And it makes it feel like a collective because they're not just employees. They become talent and people have gotten so many opportunities from that. So that level of marketing has really helped us a lot and people love it and it's been working. So how do you go? I mean, that's amazing. Number one, first of all, the Steve Madden deal. How do you go about creating brand partnerships? Obviously, you had the Shake Shack situation, Steve Madden now. What's the criteria? Do you, what do you go into it? Look at, oh, this has to be a natural fit. Obviously, you're building a community. Um, so what are, you, what are you looking for when you're trying to find a brand partner? So I'm not the average CEO, right? So, like, I do everything with my gut. It mm-hmm. got to feel good in my spirit, right? And I got to realize that, like, is it just a benefit for them? Or is it also a benefit for us? You know, oftentimes small businesses will do something just to benefit the other side because we want an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But we ain't got to do that no more, especially with everything that has happened in the last two years. Like find opportunities that will equally benefit you as well, because you got to put in the work. You got to put in the time and the energy and the money. So when I did the Shake Shack deal, I knew that was a no brainer for me. It was going to expose me to a new audience. And who doesn't like to be exposed to a new audience? Right. So it exposed me to people who have never heard of the brand. And it allowed me the ability to build relationships with people who I'm now professionally in bed with doing business. So when the Steve Madden opportunity came on, it was funny because I did like a like a summit and Steve Madden was on the summit. And one thing about me is those who take chances make advances. I'm a seize the opportunity if it's in front of my face. So he was on the Zoom and I'm like, hey, Steve, (laughs) my name is Pinky and you don't know me, but you need to look me up. And I think that we need to do a shoe deal because there is no shoe deal in the restaurant vegan space. And I think that this will be a game changer and it'll be massive. And you know what he said? He said, I love it. He said, let's set that shit up. <laughs> he said, I'm going to send you my assistant email. Let's do it. And that's exactly how it happened. All because I opened up my mouth and asked. And, you know, I think that that is a big part of partnerships and creating opportunities for your business is asking. Right. And not being afraid to ask. No, don't hurt me. And don't nobody scare me enough where I, where I don't want to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you. And if you say no, it's fine. It's just putting a battery on my back to keep going. Mm. And I did that. And the opportunity was, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. Like, it's so historic, especially with all of the stuff that Slutty Vegan is doing. And I'm so happy that we get to do it because it's going to be big. It's a, it's, a sneak, it's a sneaker? It's a sneaker. Sneak. What's it made out of? Um, all vegan leather. Vegan leather. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a, like, I feel like, and I'm glad you brought the comparison, like, I feel just the comparison, like when, when we do something or we have a moment, people salute it and they cheer it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's very similar with you. Cause like, even when we, I heard about the Shake Shack situation, obviously with, with, with your series, a, we were ruined for it. Like, yes. And we did before I even knew what you looked like. I knew who you were and I knew what slutty vegan was. Cause it was that feel like, wait, everybody's in the culture knows what this thing is. They've mm-hmm. tasted it. How do I not know? Mm-hmm. So do you feel like now, I mean, even since 2000 i mean 2018 was only four years ago which is like incredible for this at some point are the people coming to get the experience of being around you or the food or like what what is it like you know that's a good question i'm still trying to figure that out too (laughs) because i know that people love me and i'm humbled to say that right that's a good feeling right and i also know that people love my business but what i'm realizing is that there is a group of people that love pinky cole mm-hmm. and there's the people that love slutty vegan i think people know who the owner of slutty vegan is because they are so enamored with this business but then they also are getting to know me now right, right. so like you start to see pinky cole everywhere cuz all of the thought leadership and the interviews i'm doing i'm the only person that speaks on behalf of my business mm-hmm. um But whatever it is, I ain't complaining because it's good right? Right. because I get to capitalize and not just off money. Right. I get to utilize these two audiences and merge them together and make something beautiful. Right. And that's through my cookbook. That's through all the things that I have going on. That's through the accomplishments. When people see me, they see themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. They see hope. They see the idea of possibility. They see the fact that like you could be a regular degular girl from around the way and achieve and follow all your dreams and people see me and I'm motivation to them. So whether it comes through the vessel of slutty vegan or the pinky cold brand it's still a win because everybody wins at the end of the day. Yeah. And I like to motivate people. I want people to see me and like, damn pinky did it. Oh, I can do it. 
Like there's nothing impossible because this girl did it. And this is just, this is me, right? I've been pregnant for the last two years. I got locks in my head. I'm brown skin. I don't fit the status quo, right? Like I don't talk proper. I'm, I'm a sailor on the tongue sometimes, but I'm myself. Mm-hmm. And people see that you can now be yourself and be in business and build multi-million dollar businesses. Once upon a time, you had to pocket yourself and you had to reserve yourself. You ain't got to do that shit no more. You can be whoever you want to be and be uber successful in your 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 right mind and do all the things that you want to do without having to turtle or cover yourself for anybody. That's right. You vegan, said, bitch. You <laughs> said something that was key. Um, you said the, the Pinky Cole brand is like a vegan brand. How important is that for business owners, in your opinion, to have their own personal brand outside of the business brand? The reason why I ask is a uh, good friend of mine, Ronnie Brown. You know her? That's my girl. Okay. I was just on the phone with her for like an hour. Okay, yeah. She, yeah. she, she told me like a year ago, she was like, because when we first started earning, before we started earning leisure, I had my own personal page. That helped build the, the, the buzz for, for earning leisure. But when, once we got earning leisure, it became so popular, it became bigger than my own personal page. And then it kind of morphed. So like a lot of the content that was on my own personal page was on earning leisure's page, kind of the same thing. So she was telling me, she's like, I'm looking at your page and it looks like earning leisure's page. It's like, you need to have more stuff like, backstories, mm-hmm. different things that's like unique to you and not necessarily the same thing that's on Earn Your Leisure. So I did that and I started like doing different things like my wardrobe, different stuff like that just mm-hmm. to kind of build more of a personality on that and that's actually been successful. So talk about that. Like you having your own personal brand and you having slutty vegan brand and you know balancing the two. That's a really good question. So I believe that your personal brand needs to have just as much of a personality as your business, because when people look up your business for an inquisitive mind like myself, I want to know who's behind the business. And when I start looking behind the business, now I'm starting to look at like, what do you do for a living? I'll give you an example. So I love to invest. Real estate is my new thing. Like I'm addicted to real estate. It's like tattoos. (laughs) Right. So this guy sent me a DM and he wanted to, he was looking for a partner to do Airbnb. He was looking for an investor. Right. So the business page was fantastic. I'm like, Oh, this looks good. Then when I went to his personal page, his pants sagging, he got guns (laughs) in the camera. I'm like, hold up, wait a minute. But what I realized, and I told him straight up, I'm like, hey, your business looks great. But in order for me to ever want to do business with you, like I would never do business with somebody who shows up this way personally because you are a reflection of your business. Mm. So, no, you don't have to be as famous as what your business is, but you got to have some class, some tech and how you show up as a reflection of how people uh, assume your business and how they see it. So just like you on my personal page, I show you the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes. Right. I show you the behind the build. I show you the accomplishments, the things that I don't necessarily put on a slutty vegan page. But I want you to get the idea of what the backstory looks like. And then you get to know who I am, the speaking engagements like I don't even put my speaking engagements on a slutty vegan page because I wanted to have a life of his own but I want you to know where that life came from and that life came from me the owner but I make sure that how I show up on my page is tactful uh, I, I'm not doing a lot of cursing on my page um, cursing but not a lot of cursing you know what I'm saying how I'm showing up you see a little bit of family you see a little bit of my relationship but you also see how I build on the back end so it's very necessary to basically show up with respect to your own personal brand because people are paying attention to that and most times these big investors if you are looking for investors that's the kind of research that they do they'll go to Instagram and don't believe believe it or not people actually still go to Facebook Right. And although my Facebook is not active, there are people that go to my Facebook to figure out who I used to be. Right. Like where I came from, what I did in high school. And people do that kind of research. So just make sure that your personal brand speaks to your business brand as well, especially if you want to be successful. So speaking of your personal brand, you got a new brand title, Mother. What what has that been like over the past two years? Obviously having a child and, you know, another one on the way. So what is that like? Because business has been booming. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't look like it's going to slow down at any time. So what has that, that chapter been like for you? Um, it's hard. And I used to lie to myself, like, yeah, it's easy. It's easy because I got a nanny, mm-hmm. right? Like, my mom helps. Um, and I have a good support system and my partner is present. But it is not easy. 
being a entrepreneur and a mother? Is it possible? Absolutely. Some people don't have as much help as I do. And if I didn't have this level of help, it probably would even be harder. So I commend mothers around the world who have to take care of their kids, go to work, do all of this stuff and don't even have the support that they need because that shit ain't no joke. Like it's not a joke because what I realized is, and I'm being totally transparent here as a woman and a mother, my dream is to be a super uber successful entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. but it was also my dream to be a mother, right? So as a mother, I realized that I can't be a hundred percent in both areas. So sometimes I fall short in the mother department. And I have mother guilt. And I know I'm not the only person that feels like this. And what mother guilt looks like is I see my mother babysitting my daughter while I'm working and I got like five different meetings. And then I got to step back and like, all right, you need to spend some time. But then I also realize I don't want to have to compromise. I don't want to have to just be a mother and I can't be a businesswoman or be a businesswoman and I can't be a mother. I feel like women should be able to do and have it all. It's just about balance and I'm adjusting. It's Mm -hmm. a good adjustment, Mm -hmm. but I'm finally at a place where I can openly and transparently say that because everybody won't tell the truth about that. Right? Like Mm -hmm. I literally, I have about four, three to four interviews every single day. Then I'm in a relationship. So you got to keep the relationship spicy. Right? Then I still have to be a philanthropist, a leader, I have over 200 um, employees at my company, so I still got to be the CEO to them so that they can feel safe and do all the things that they want to do in the business. So I wear a lot of hats and now I'm just making sure that I'm not spreading myself too thin with those hats. And that's why I start bringing in the right team, So let's, which is very important. Extremely. Let's talk about this. The moment we all been waiting for. $25 million was raised in your Series A round, which gave you a $100 million valuation. People see the headlines. A lot of people don't even know what a Series A is. <laughs> right, right, right. They might not even know why you actually even raised the money. What's the plan? So I, I have an idea of it, but I want to hear it from you. What, when did you realize? Oh, you, you're constantly scaling, right? So you start, you start in the ghost kitchen. Then you go to a food truck. Then you go to a restaurant. Now you're in the VC world where you're raising a lot of money to take this thing, you know, national, possibly even globally. When did you get that mindset of, okay, I want to raise money because you don't probably necessarily need the money to scale, Mm -hmm. but it's going to help you scale at a faster pace and the relationship. So what, who turned you on to that? What, how did that thinking happen? What was the deal with that? So since the very beginning, I had people knocking on my door to give me money. Like knocking, still knocking. DCs or angels? Everybody. Everybody. The the biggest CEOs (laughs) or the biggest companies, the places we eat every single day, knocking on my door saying, hey, can we either buy the business? Can we invest in the business? Can we be a partner? And it felt so good to be able to say, no, not right now. Right? Because I had something that was growing and still building. So many people even still want to franchise the business. But when I realized that I needed to... uh, not just raise money, but I needed to bring in support of an outside party is when I learned that the business started being bigger than me. Do you know what I mean when I say that? When you are scaling a company, you start, you have to start bringing in the level of expertise that you don't have. Mm -hmm. Right. So Mm -hmm. remember what I told you in the beginning, this was a passion project for me. And as a passion project, right, I'm, I'm not a restaurant tour. I just happened to be that way. And I know so much, as I know, but there comes a time where in order to open up all of these restaurants, I need to start bringing people on my team that have scaled restaurants because I'd sit here and be lying to you if I said that I just do all of this myself. Do I read books to get better and become a better CEO? Absolutely. But it wasn't just a money play. It was strategic partnerships because I wanted to have people come into my business that have done this before, that have built billion dollar companies that can help me build my billion dollar company. And that's why I did it. And I'm happy that I did it. Um, for a long time, I'm like, no, me, my, like, I'm not sharing, like, this is my business. I'm not doing under that. And I think that every entrepreneur goes through that, that has like a budding business that's growing. I was very selfish with my business as I should be. Right. But I realized that you go stronger together. And that was a very hard lesson for me to learn. We've always been cash flow positive. We've always been good. But I realized if you really want to grow this company and create generational wealth for your family, you got to get on the money team. You got to get on a winning team and a winning team looks like operational support, 
from a Danny Meyer who has created and grown Shake Shack to the billion dollar company that it is. Mm -hmm. And then my lead, Richie Lou Dennis, who owns Essence Magazine and Essence Festival, he's the marketing guru, right? Like that's access to a whole new audience that I can always tap into as my investor. So I had to be strategic about it. And now I got the two Michael Jordans on my team, the Michael Jordan of marketing. I got the Michael Jordan of food. And then you got Pinky Cole. Like that's a recipe for success. So I'm so happy that I did it. Um, and I'm looking forward to the level of growth that's about to take place because of this. So, so when you when you were raising the capital, um, we didn't get a call, by the way. <laughs> just out, just she has my number. So. Yeah. And so the plan. All right. So now you have this capital and I read somewhere 20 locations. That's the immediate goal. S- speaking conservatively. Speaking conservatively. So I, I rather when they say under. um Something and over deliver under promise over deliver. Yes, I like rather under promise and over deliver. Um, and what we're doing now is, and being totally transparent, it cost me more than six hundred fifty thousand dollars to build one location, mm. right? But we're trying to find ways to lower that cost so that we can build more locations, right? That's business. That's yeah. what you do. Um, but hopefully, it'll be more than twenty. But just speaking conservatively. So, so the goal is, is to obviously be a billion dollar company, mm-hmm. and so. Real estate is one of your plays. And so I'm wondering, how, how do we get it from the $100 million valuation to the billion-dollar valuation? Is it now making it real estate kind of a la like what McDonald's has done? And real estate is the, the business, but the food is what brings you to the real estate. Is is that what you're doing? or yep. It is. Oh, I was saying, oh, from the beginning. Okay. Are, are we so, adding other things to make the valuation go up? So that too. So we have a 70%, 30% portfolio. So 70% of the prop slutty vegan uh, businesses, I own the real estate, right? And the reason why I did that is because I wanted to go in inner city communities, communities that developers aren't so attractive to. And areas that are right in the heart of gentrification. And what Slutty Vegan does is go into the neighborhood, raise up the value of that community, help other business owners because we always got lines down the block. So they win when we win. Mm -hmm. We win when they win. Right. And that has worked for us. And I always said that if for whatever reason Slutty Vegan does not work out. I own the real estate. So now we raise the value of um, the, the buildings that we own and it taps into what the overall company is worth. That's one. Secondly, um, I own Bar Vegan and Bar Vegan is a sister concept to Slutty Vegan, which is doing extremely well in Atlanta. So we're also scaling Bar Vegan. So now I got two multi-million dollar companies. So I'm putting Bar Vegan in uh, big cities only. So it's a tourist attraction in big cities only. So the revenue from Bar Vegan will tap into the Slutty Vegan revenue and then it will go to the overall valuation. So we're very strategic in how we do it. Oh, the other piece that I didn't even mention is we're now in Targets with our dip. Mm -hmm. We got a chicken dip and um, and we got a chicken dip and a spinach dip. But what we're doing is now we have a whole retail department. So the retail business is a whole nother business right. outside of the burgers, fries and pies. And we just got a big order from a really, really big grocery chain and they ordered 60,000 units of our dip. So as we continue to grow out that department, then we have the restaurants that we continue to scale. Right. We have new concepts that we'll be building out. Uh, we got a movie in the works. We got a cookbook called Eat Plants, Bitch, that's dropping in November. All of these things will tie into the bigger picture. I saw CBD gummies. We got CBD gummies. Let's not forget that. We got bacon. Yeah. We got seasoning. We got a lot of stuff, yeah. right? Which is why I'm confident about the fact that the company will continue to be uber successful. Like a hundred million dollar valuation is good, right? But if you're in business, you know that like we still got a long way to go. Gotta touch yeah. that B. Right. We got to touch at that least, B. At least. We yeah. got to touch the B. And it's not just about the money. It's about the impact and the legacy and the fact that we've been able to take this company from here all the way here and we can create something that people can really be proud of. And all of those things that I told you will get us to that. And that's just on the business side. Yeah. Now, on the Pinky Code brand side, I also do real estate outside of the business. Mm-hmm. So currently, I own about 18 properties right now. Closing on a property today. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> in Atlanta? In Atlanta. All your properties in Atlanta? Um, most of them. I got some in Birmingham, too. I got... Birmingham, uh, Alabama. Alabama? Yeah, I got seven in Birmingham. Nice place. We, uh, yeah. we, we, we visited last year. Birmingham is a great place. Yeah. Um, but I realized that real wealth lies in real estate. So I'm going to always be straight. Whether it's through slutty vegan or whether it's through real estate, I'm going to always be good. What's your strategy for real estate? How do you find properties? Instagram. 
<laughs> <laughs> so I'll put a message on my Instagram, like, let me buy your house. And people DM me and they tell me, hey, I got a house. I'm trying to sell it. So I usually get to get the houses off market, right, at a lower cost. And I ain't got to pay the high fees. Sometimes I pay cash. Sometimes I don't. Um, and it's worked out for me. And I'm doing a buy and hold play, right? I got some tenants. And I'm just holding on to these properties. And as I watch my equity raise in value, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to be straight. So by the time that I turn 40, 45, then all these streams will be coming from everywhere. And I'll be always good. So you use your culture capital to build the generational wealth. Absolutely. The power of Instagram. Power of Instagram. <laughs> very, very Instagram did yeah. pay me. <laughs> yeah. can, can, can we talk about your philanthropy, though? Absolutely. Let's talk about that. Obviously, uh, you know, we, we saw what you did with uh, Clark Atlanta mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, getting LLCs for the graduating class. But you have an uh, initiative that you're about to start now with Vero Bank. Mm-hmm. Um, food Trust, can you talk about that? Well, th- there's a lot of things I want to talk about here. And this is another important piece for entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. You know, once upon a time, you could just sell products and that was good enough. But it's not good enough just to sell products. And I think big corporations see that too because they have to find ways to stand in solidarity with small businesses and communities. That's the only way that you can win now, Right. So I've always had this philanthropic arm. I saw my mother growing up helping everybody. As you Jamaican, so you understand. Help everybody, right? Like, gotcha. like who are you helping now? <laughs> but I needed to see my mother do that because yeah. it brings me a level of fulfillment to know that I can use my resources and my platform to help people. So in 2019, I started this foundation. And like I said before, we've done so much. Um, when Rashad Brooks was murdered in a Wendy's parking lot, Myself and my partner, we paid for life insurance. We bought a brand new car for the family. We partnered with CAU to provide $600,000 worth of scholarships. Um, I've paid the local rents of businesses, partnered with Steve Harvey and Marjorie Harvey Foundation to provide lights for families. Myself and Derek just recently partnered with Prudential Life Insurance to provide every single black man in Atlanta that makes $30,000 or less life insurance that we pay for, that mm. they don't have to pay for. Is that the Square One program? That's the Square One program, Okay, um, which is a really big deal because we really don't talk about life insurance in our communities, right? So now we are being the change that we wish to see to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, the LLCs doing the commencement and providing all 824 students with the path to entrepreneurship, right? That, you know, we always say in our communities that we don't have access to information. Now you do. Here you go. Mm-hmm. And I'm not just giving you an LLC. I'm giving you the pathway to learn about financial literacy and what you could do with that LLC, whether you work with somebody or not. Um, and then Borrow Bank, we're about to do um, a, a food truck tour where I'm continuing to offer LLC, right? Like freedom is what I talked to y'all about in the beginning, Right. Freedom is the best feeling in the world because it allows you the ability to do all the things that you want to do on your time, on your dime. And if I can teach people how to capitalize off their own freedom, we'd have more entrepreneurs in the world. We will create more opportunities. And I'm not saying everybody got to be an entrepreneur. I want to be very clear because, you know, there's this thing that like, oh, well, some people want to work a nine to five. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But for the people who want to create that level of freedom for themselves and build generational wealth. I want to be able to help them tap into that. And I'm doing that with providing them with that pathway to be able to start their own. Powerful. Um, so let's talk about this conversation. We talk about Chipotle. We look at McDonald's all publicly traded companies. Is that a plan to take your company to the stock market? You know, I thought about that. Um, and it's funny, this part of the conversation is always so taboo because some people are like, don't talk about that. Don't tell them what you want to do. Don't tell your plans. But I'm just rolling with it. Right. Like if you would have asked me that four years ago, I, I wouldn't know the answer to that. I wouldn't know that I would have all these locations and doing so well and raise this money. I wouldn't know that. But what I do know is that whatever happens, Slutty Vegan will be a household name. Mm -hmm. whatever happens, I'm going to create opportunity for other people. Some days I'm like, damn, this will be dope to go public as a company because I am who I am because of the community. Why not let the community tap into that? And then some days I'm like, okay, maybe one day I will sell my company. Who knows? And then some days I'm like, I ain't selling shit. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I'm just, I'm just pass this down to my family. And all days I'm like, whatever it is, the beauty in the business is that I got options. And I can make those decisions if I want to. But I'm really focused on 
building the brand and scaling culture. The hardest thing in the world that I'm dealing with right now is learning how to scale culture. It sounds easy, right? Mm -hmm. But how do I make this experience at my Edgewood location be the same experience at my Gwinnett location, my Athens, my New York location? Scaling culture is so important because that's really what the, the business relies on, the culture. And if the culture is not there, then I have nothing. The food can be good all day long, but that culture is customer service. That culture is how the employees show up to the consumer. That culture is the internal customer, which is the employee making sure that they're happy. You know, right now is the biggest labor shortage in the market that we've ever had before. So I had to start incentivizing my employees in a different way, raising a minimum wage, giving them life insurance, giving them full benefits if they're just crew members and making 40 hours a week. Right. But I'm focused on scaling culture. And once I can master that, then I'll start thinking about the other things. So it's this vegan conversation. There's different sides to this coin. I'm learning. There's like the plant based people mm-hmm. who are like, they're like hardliners. Have you got pushback from that community? Hold on, what been- you mean when you say hardliners? Because I think you mean the vegans are the hardliners. Like the pure vegans? So like, so, like, my guy, 19 Keys, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, 19 Keys, real big online thought leader. So, he did a show with. I forgot the gentleman's name, but he's in the nutrition. And he was like, I don't call myself vegan. I'm plant based because vegans, you technically you could be a vegan and, and eat, you know, French fries and drink beer. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to eat healthy. So some people say like the soy products, your stuff may not necessarily be as healthy as like vegans that only eat like chickpeas and vegetables, like raw vegetables. So, have you had any pushback for that? Absolutely. What's your thoughts on that? I don't care. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why I don't care. I, I think th- the problem has been with veganism for so long is that we put so many labels. And I can say it because I'm a part of the lifestyle. There's always been so many labels. I've seen vegans like, well, if you don't eat this, then you're going to die. And like, you're going to like, <laughs> I, I'm not that kind of vegan. If you want to eat a steak, that's up to you. But I'm here going to eat my chickpeas and I'm going to have my little processed vegan burger here and there because I like to eat it. Right. And I'm going to feel better about myself and you can feel better about yourself. And there is no judgment and we can coexist. My partner, who I have children with, is not vegan. Right. And he can live how he want to live. I tell him the food that I eat. If you want to eat what I'm eating, then that's cool. But what makes Slutty Vegan successful is we don't push our agenda on anybody. Right. And I think that that is what really separates us because it doesn't feel like just a vegan concept and like, oh, we're this glorified group that's better than everybody else. This ain't that. My audience is not vegan. Ninety seven percent of the people who come to Slutty Vegan are meat eaters. And we like it that way. The name of my book is Eat Plants, Bitch. Ninety one (laughs) recipes to blow your meat loving mind. Like I'm tapping into the people who eat pork, chicken, beef, because if I can change your consciousness, whether it's with vegan burgers and fries, then I know I've done something right. And the goal is to do everything in moderation. Mm. I'm not going to sit here and tell you to eat slutty vegan every single day, all day. That's just not what I'm going to do. And I'm Mm. always transparent about that. But I do want you to understand how veganism can be healthier, even if it starts at burgers and fries, even if you want to do it for the animals. There's so many reasons why you can do it. So I asked you about the hard line question is because there's a difference between vegan and plant based living. Vegans are people who don't eat, don't wear leather. They don't eat any animal products or any animal byproducts. Somebody who is plant based will wear leather. Right. But will not eat meat. So there's a difference. My mission is to remove all of those labels, whether you're flexitarian, vegetarian, meat eater. I just want you to have some options that didn't require an animal to be slaughtered. Right. And if I can get you to try this vegan burger and fry and you like it, then I know you can go to the next restaurant and get an alkaline meal mm-hmm. and you go to the next restaurant and say, you know, what? I had slightly vegan vegan food is actually kind of good. What y'all got this vegan on the menu? And that is the goal. And if I can can do can do that by meeting people where they are, then I know for sure that eventually we'll have more people that will start to eat healthier or think about eating different food and just transforming their lifestyles. So. Obviously, when the the business scales and you have a bunch of locations, franchises, right? Is there a program for franchisors? So if I wanted to have a... No. no. 
Nope. That, so how? What was what's the process? It's, it's all it, private. It's all private. Corporately owned. Okay. I'm still building a brand. It's still a baby. Yeah. Think about a three and a half year old still learning. You just started learning how to walk not too long ago. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We're still fixing our operation. Yeah. We got speed bumps. We still getting it right, which is why I brought in the operational support because we ain't got it all together. Yeah. Um, is that a vision though, long term? Not right now. Okay. And if I do, it has to be an operator that has been in business for a while that is proven to scale restaurants. And the reason why is because I ain't do this for money, right? Mm-hmm. Right now. I could say, y'all, I'm franchising, and I could be a billionaire today franchising my business. Right. You know what I mean? People want to franchise Slutty Vegan. I could do that right now. But I realized the bigger picture, and the bigger picture here is that I'm very intentional about what I do. And if I do that today, then the true essence of the business, I'm going to lose it. Good loss, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather continue to build it, and then who knows what may happen down the line. But right now, I'm, I'm in a good space, and I'm happy where I'm at. And yeah. I'm happy about the bill. So um, one of the things that uh, our brothers at Slim and Huskies, they, they got, obviously you said you had to deal with, uh, I believe, Target, right? Mm-hmm. For the dip. Are, are frozen goods via like the sandwiches one of the vision or on the vision board so that we can consume it if we can't come to Atlanta or we can't get to one of the locations? Like the Hot Pockets? We, yeah, like we can actually get it in our grocery store. So y- you will be able to get something in the grocery store, but it will be our proprietary patty. Okay. Okay. So oh, not like the so frozen, much. Like, the frozen like a Beyond Meat type situation. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean that that is where where the, the real wealth is. I'll take right? it. I'll take it. All right. Like cutting out the middle man, and <laughs> yeah. obviously I have great partners. Shout out to Impossible and Beyond Meat. Yeah. But as we scale and grow, we realize that if we have our own proprietary patty one day, people will support it and they buy into it. So we're in the R and D phase, working on some things. And I'm excited about the I'm future. Exci- for that. I'm excited to and hear that's that. It's really big, yeah, right? Yeah. Because now we step into the marketplace with a whole new product that really created this whole conglomerate of a business. And once we become successful with that, the stores just become the, the face front. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take it. I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. When I told <laughs> my wife that we were sitting down with you, she was like, can you bring back a burger? And I'm like, well, we're doing oh, it. I said, we're doing it. We not, I'm not coming home for five days. She was like, mm-hmm. put it in Mikey's fridge. I said, no, nah, you got to come back That's to Atlanta. Taste good. <laughs> we can't do that. No, nah, I mean, it's good. And to be honest, you know, that's kind of how I grew up. My mom's a vegetarian. She's been a vegetarian for pretty much my whole life. And oh. she used to, she always to this day, she cooks like the, with the bacon and the and the burgers and I never got into it because I'm like it's fake like you know what I'm saying? I, I, that was my mindset that was my mindset they did though I'm like that's true um, but I've changed that like eating your food a couple other people's food and I'm like it's actually good so like for years I actually would not eat it for years I would not eat the 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 um, bacon and the, yeah, that's crazy. The first place I had turkey bacon was at your crib. Well, that's turkey. I bacon. know. I'm just saying. I always had <laughs> eating pork and turkey. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about vegan talking bacon. About I know vegan bacon. Yeah. Uh-huh. So um, I say that to say, you, that's not easy to do. You changed my mind on it, what? and my own mom didn't even. I didn't taste her food for a long time. Oh, damn. <laughs> so that damn. says a lot. Um, your cultural influence, and um, you're doing a great job. I think we got a classic interview. What do you guys think? I'd say I would say so. I think it's like enough for you already. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you taking the time <laughs> to, to, yeah. to, to sit yeah, down. Mike, with Mike us. definitely was the first person that said it, and That's so they were like, "Before we go, we got to ask: Is there like a front of the line pass? <laughs> like if, if Earn Your Leisure pulls up <laughs> to Slutty <laughs> Vegan, <laughs> is there a front of the line pass? It could be a front of the line pass, but you know, I'm a businesswoman first, so I'm like, "Well, how can we collaborate? Yeah. Can we oh, Alicia, oh, the Alicia, the limited, the limited edition Alicia Burger." In store, pop up. Oh, that's major. And you coming to New York, so you know. I'm yeah. com- Oh, so we gotta do something I'm crazy. Coming to New York, we having a block party. I already got the stamp of approval from the mayor. Maybe y'all come and do an episode. Too easy. That's, the that's, the, that's, that's way too, too easy. easy. This summer. Well, July. Well, all right. Yeah. Show us the dates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, that's too easy. in New York, in Brooklyn or Harlem. Fort Greene. Oh, yeah. Brooklyn. We open in Harlem too, though. Okay. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh let's, boy. Let's figure that out. Yeah. You can't come to New York without tapping in with us. Yeah. That's, that's we, we definitely got to do that because let me tell you something. In the next five years, Slutty Vegan will in fact be a household name around the world. So this will be a classic. Yeah. That's a fact. That's a yeah. fact. And you know when we go when we go to Africa, we got to let you know, and so I'm we can go together. I, I got something I want to ask you too yeah. off camera because okay. you said 
closed mouths don't get fed or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you like to tell the people? Any last words, uh, social media handles, uh, locations, website, all that stuff? Yeah, well, not that, because, I mean, I feel like people... Everybody already know that. <laughs> but I specifically want to talk to entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, you are literally looking at somebody who comes from humble beginnings. I'm the first to go to college. My, my, my father was incarcerated nearly all of my life. My mother put her dreams on hold to make sure that everybody was good. I literally... Two years ago, just paid my student loans off with one check with Miss Lucy and Navient. $260,000 one time. And I say all that to say that, like, I am living proof that nothing is impossible. And if you got a dream, that thing that makes your belly leap, and it gets me emotional because, you know, some people like I made it. And I'm like every day I'm like, damn, I made it. And I'm nowhere where I want to be. But if you got a dream. And you got that vision and make your belly leap. I don't give a fuck. Don't let nobody tell you you can't do it. Don't let nobody tell you that your dream is not big enough, that it's too small. You got to keep doing that thing. Because if I would have stopped at that restaurant in Harlem, I would not be here. So that's my advice. I'm pregnant, so I'm crying. (laughs) (laughs) But that is my advice for entrepreneurs because every day I wake up. Let me tell you something. Have you ever in your life said that your wildest dreams came true. Literally, my wildest dreams have come true. There's not a dream that has not been fulfilled in my life. And not many people in the world can say that. Amen. And it's because of tenacity. It's because of grit. And it's because I didn't give up. So if you are an entrepreneur, these are real tears from somebody who got it out the mud. And I will build a billion dollar brand. And you can too, just believe in yourself. And you can find me on Google. <laughs> Google me. <laughs> you can Google me because I'll be there. <laughs> but yeah. It's the first time, too. A tear jerker. It's also the baby. <laughs> tear jerker. But now, nah, y'all, let me tell you something for real, man. Like, you said something when I came in. You was like, well, you a celebrity. I'm like, no, I'm not. But, and then I was on Good Morning America. And it was like, you like the modern day Oprah? I'm like, damn, like, you put me in a sentence with people like that? Like, that's big. It's really big. And then I look at my bank account and I'm like, damn. Like, <laughs> I got one, two, like, three, four, five, six. Like, and like, I'm looking at Red was like, damn, I got more than you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so humbling. Yeah. And it's funny because the more money I got now, I'm so cheap. I'm cheap as fuck. Like, I'm frugal. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just a good feeling because I'm like, I wish I could bottle this feeling up and sell it. Because I got so much gratitude, which is why I always do right by people. Because I get blessings, y'all, back to back. Every week is a blessing. Mm. Every single week I get a new blessing. Like, I'm like, why me? Like, it's just, I'm just me. But every single week something is good. Something good is happening for me. And I'm just so grateful with, like, the support. And to know that people really love me, like... I'm like, what I do? You know what I'm saying? But you, you, you it's be, a good feeling. You become an inspiration. Yeah. So, humble. You know, when we did the Steve Harvey episode, I think we got to have... Jamal, Jamal, Jamal might be the he, trick. Yeah, he might be the trick. But when we did the Steve Harvey episode, I was like, yo, we're going to win an Emmy for this. Like, this is award-winning journalism. Yeah. I get this feeling from this episode. I saw that Steve Harvey win. It was good. Legendary like that one? situation. That was Appreciate very legendary. I feel like this is a legendary situation. Tear Joker. It had every aspect. <laughs> Education, entertainment. Inspiration. Inspiration. And ended with, it's like a movie. And actual <laughs> items too. It's not a podcast. Yeah. It's a movie. It's yeah. definitely a movie. Motion and picture. And I pray that everybody that watched this follows that movie. Yeah. Because it's a sequel to this movie. This shit going to keep going. Stay tuned. <laughs> it's, called, <laughs> it's called Stay Tuned. So... Let us know about um, the block party. Definitely want to do that. As long as we in town, that's that's too easy for us to do. And like I said, I want I want we got something big. Uh, I would like you to be a part of it if you can. Absolutely. Um, Y'all got tears out of me. I don't even cry. Good morning, America. It's the EYL. It's the EYL effect. Good morning, America. Couldn't do that. (laughs) It's called the biggest. Shroy, housekeeping items. Man, I just I was touched and motivated and. I'm extremely humbled by you being so authentic here today. Um, I just want to say, man, nothing happens before it's time. Like I said, we, we've been trying to sit down for two years and we're just super patient about it.
but the time it couldn't have been more right, more perfect um, than it is right now. So I want to salute and congratulate you for everything you've done Thank and anything you're going to continue to do. Because like you said, this is just the beginning, right? Four, we're talking four years in business. So, I mean, just it imagine. Four what, years, August 6th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. August 6th, a good date. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just congratulations to you and the entire team and your partner. Uh, you know, hopefully one day we'll get a cheese steak. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, shout out to all our, our patrons and, and everybody on EYL University, all our earners, everybody that's supporting the merch, and everybody's just supporting us on a personal and professional level. We uh, are extremely grateful, and uh, we will continue to speak for us and do the work that we've been bestowed to do. Um, so love is love. We appreciate y'all. Thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. It's called Rough and Peace. Come on, y'all. My graduates from my school being Forbes, backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>